Crusaders. I am Brooke Black, your host today here on the Grit Crusade podcast, and we are live on location from Landers Toyota in Northwest Arkansas. So we want to give a sh- big shout out to them for allowing us to use their new central office. And I have the pleasure of having probably one of the most special guests I've ever had on my podcast, my dad. Yay! <laughs> Rodney Plack is here, and he is the car businessman in Central Arkansas and the southeast part of the U.S. and currently leading the Landers Toyota Northwest Arkansas team, right? Right. And you've been in the car car business for how many years? Uh, 39 years. 39 years. So he is all things leadership. He's all things empowering people to make a great living while also working really hard at what they do and making sure that they spend time doing the things that matter to them, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about how you got in the car business. I needed a job. He needed a job. I was working with Kenny Shoes in uh, Tulsa, and they wanted me to go to Little Rock. So I I came to Little Rock. And and you were a shoe salesman. I was selling shoes for Kenny Shoes. Yes. And then uh, I did that for about three years. And then they wanted to send me to Emporia, Kansas. And I said, no, I'm not going to Emporia, Kansas. So I quit work where I bought a car at Little Rock Dodge. And stayed there seven years and managed there and then went to Landers and been with Landers ever since. And so part of your the story that I love the most to share about him is uh, now my dad's built a really successful career and provided great for his family. But you came to Arkansas with $100 and a dog. That's the that's the story. Yeah. $100 it, and a dog. Is that true? Yep. Is that a real story? That's what kind of story. dog was it? Uh, half chow, half German shepherd. What was its name? Shay. Shay. Yep. How long did Shay live? Shay, I don't know. I gave her to my brother, and oh. I think she, I think she ran away. Oh, I, I think I would run away from Ricky too. Yeah, probably at away, that yeah. age of Ricky, I probably would have ran away yeah. from him too. So, but you and your brother work together now. We do. Yeah. So, what does Ricky do? <clears throat> so, Ricky runs the used car department. He was with the uh, Fayetteville Auto Park for 15 years as their GM of their used car department. And uh, when I came here, he came with me, and that was in April of 17. Yeah. Okay. But he actually, like, funny story, kind of in the middle, he got a job at the auto park that was in the brand of like families that you were working in before you came to Landers Toyota Same company, and didn't even tell him he was your brother. Right. Yeah. yeah and he, they, didn't, he didn't want to get the job based on knowing me. Yeah. Yeah. And you so. were like, do they know who you are yet? Like, I mean, we have a unique last name, so I feel like somebody should have noticed, but they didn't. They didn't know. Yeah. They didn't notice at all. No. So we skipped ahead a little bit. So you took the job at Little Rock Dodge mm-hmm. and you were there as a salesman. Mm-hmm. So yeah. for a year, then managed for, for six and a half years. How has your management style changed since then? Well, back in in the early years in the car business. In the 80s, right? Yeah, 84. Yeah. yeah. 84, you, you worked uh, all the time. You worked bell to bell. Worked 8 o'clock till 9 or 10 o'clock at night till when everybody left. Six days a week, seven days a week? Seven days a week most of the time, and then sometimes six days a week. No vacations, no time off. It was, it was a hard way to make a living. But, 100% uh, commission. Uh, yeah, straight commission, yeah. yeah. I did that for seven years, and then I went to Landers, and it was similar uh, back then, but... Uh, as I became a manager, I changed the way that uh, you manage people and gave them time off. And yeah. It's ama- amazing when they have time off, uh, when they come to work, they want to work. Yeah. Because uh, they've had their time off. And they're grateful to have a job that lets them have time Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Yeah. So very flexible in our, in our schedules. And you do your job. If you want to take off, go take off. If we, have the, if we have the staff, we don't care if you're there or not. Yeah. And I think that that has trickled down to you know, dealerships all across Arkansas, because I feel like no matter what kind of car me or my friends want to buy, most of the dealerships have some of your staff there. Most of them. Like you've raised up so many of these young men and women, and then they've used a lot of those, you know, procedures in the places they are. Because I mean, I know growing up with you being gone all the time, working all the time. I mean, you didn't have a college degree. No. So that's what, that's the only way you can make a living for your family. You work. Yep. But when, when you were, when you did have a day off in the car business, you used to put a lawnmower in the back of your truck. I did. Yeah, yeah. I did. I put a lawnmower in the back of my Omni, a demo. I didn't have a truck. Oh, Omni. Yeah. And little, left the trunk open? Omni car and left the truck open, and I'd, I'd go door to door down on Asher and uh, Cedar back there, back where the hood's at. Yeah. And I'd yeah, mow for Arkansas, one or yeah. two or three dollars. I'd knock on the door and say, uh, can I mow your grass? They'd say, I don't have any money. They'd say, how much? I'd say, 10 bucks, whatever the figure was, depending right. on how big the yard was. And I'd say, well, how much do you got? And most time they said two or three bucks. And I said, give it to me. And I got my milk jug of gas pulled my push mower out, mowed their yard, and I went to the next house. Where has so, that work ethic gone? Yeah, people today, right? Pe- people today, the, 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 the younger generation hasn't had to work for a living because of our generation. Yeah. And the generation specifically before us. Right. Because we had to scratch and, and dig for everything or we had nothing. Yeah. And today, the, the younger generation, they'll never have that work ethic because they didn't have to work hard growing up. 
So how do people, how do you think people today can raise their kids to have that kind of work ethic when they don't really have to scratch as much? Well, you got to make them earn what they get. You can't just hand them everything. Yeah, right. You know, we know a lot of people in this world that have been handed things and they don't turn out real well personally. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, professionally, That's the truth. they can yeah. do good. But if you're, if you're handed everything in life, you, you, don't, you, don't, you don't have any value. You don't value anything because you were given it. You don't know what it's like to, if you had to scratch and claw to buy your first car or you were given your first car, which one are you going to take care of the best? Mm -hmm. The one you had to scratch, yeah, and that thing's going to be spit shine and clean and nice. If somebody just gives you a car, you don't value it. Yeah. And, and that's, that's just a, a, the way it is in everything, whether it's your car, your job, your home, your everything. And that's it in a nutshell. No doubt. You don't have to work for it. It's not going to be real important to you. Well, how did you teach me to have the kind of work ethic that I have when I didn't, I, I mean, you bought my first car for me. Well, I did buy your first car, but I made you, I made you appreciate everything that you got. Yeah, that's true. And, and you saw the way that I um, worked in my life. Yeah, absolutely. And it, that trickled down to you. I think so. And I think too, one of the things that I tell my friends that are, you know, raising their kids is um, there was never like a never ending pot of money. I always had allowance. Like in high school, I had a hundred dollars a month. And that yep. was a lot like that, mm -hmm. at that time, you know, in the early 2000s where that was my gas money and everything else was, you know, you guys of course, like bought me school clothes and had groceries and stuff, but all my spending money I had to work for. And then even in college, I got a check a month and that's that was what it. You got. You and that was it. That, that's what and you got. That was uh, it. Yeah. And it, t and it wasn't like I was doing without, but it taught me to live within my means always. Mm -hmm. And like come hell or high water. I remember one time in college, it was the end of the month. Cause you always sent me my check at the beginning of the month. That's when they like came in the mail, you know, before mm -hmm. people like transferred money instantaneously. And I had a headlight out. And so I called the dealership um, in Fayetteville on uh, college to ask how much it was going to be to change my headlight out or whatever. And I don't remember what the figure was. I feel like it was like 80 bucks or something. And I didn't have the money. And so I was like, okay, I'm smart. Like I can figure this out. So I drove to O'Reilly Auto Parts or the Napa Auto Parts place. And I went in and told the guy, I was like, hey, I got, I need a headlight. I need to, you know, and so I bought the headlight and it was like $3. And I went back to my house and I pulled it up on the internet and printed out the instructions and went out into the like parking lot at my apartment with the instructions like laid out under my hood and figured out how to change the headlight myself. There you go. Yeah, because I didn't have any money because I couldn't pay for it, you yep. know, because I, I damn what sure wasn't calling you to ask for extra money. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you'd be like, well, what'd you spend your money on if you need a headlight? Well, you didn't yeah. plan ahead. <laughs> so, yeah, there's that. All right. So we do a fun segment on the podcast called Trivia in the Trenches where I ask you a question and try to stump you. But I think you're going to know this one but I still thought it was a good question. Okay. okay, you ready? All right, so here's trivia in the trenches. What is the name given to the person rolling the dice in a game of craps? Shooter. Oh, you did know it. I thought like maybe you might not know like the actual name of the person. I remember like you playing craps growing up at the casino yeah, and stuff. I, yeah, that's my game. That's if, your I, game if, I, yeah. if I ever go, that's yeah. what I like yeah, to play Yeah, me too. I, I like to play craps too. I remember we used to have one in high school. We had a pool table and you had like the felt one you could like roll out on top of the pool table. All right, so here's some fun facts about craps. Did you know that it dates back to mid medieval times? They've been playing craps like all the way back then. They found it like in the hieroglyphics and like different pieces I of the board not. and stuff. Yeah. And one of the biggest craps wins ever recorded was in 1992. It was a guy named Archie Karras won the largest run over a period of several weeks at Forty million dollars in craps, and so I took that and put it in like an inflation calculator to see, like, okay, nineteen ninety two to two thousand twenty three, forty million dollars. Now, guess how much you think forty million dollars would be now, like the equivalent? Two million. Forty million? No, what it would be now, like Ford? Oh, like it was forty million in twenty in nineteen ninety two. What would that be now? Oh, let's say two hundred million. Okay, not quite that bad, but eighty six. Yeah million nine hundred eighty seven dollars that wow. crazy yeah that's good that's like i mean I could over that. double yeah. yeah yeah so if you had 40 million then that's what it would be worth now so and like except if you still had 40 million then you would be half that so be broke and no interest <laughs> and all those things to so be weird so all right so all right so we know you've done you know smart work and leadership what advice would you give to someone that's starting their career and maybe they're just now getting their first sales manager job whether it's at retail store or service industry or whatever what advice would you give to them uh, listen, you can't learn anything from talking. Mm, no that's... one has ever learned anything from talking because you can't. it's impossible. So you have to listen to people that have more experience than you do to learn anything. Yeah. So it'd be listen. Yeah. So what, what 
what advice do you give to your salesman now? Like, I know one of the really, I grew up licking stamps for the Christmas cards we had to send out to your customers. Mm -hmm. And so like one of the really important parts of your business is repeat customers. And so how do you get your salesman to build that repeat customer over and over again? Well, <clears throat> first of all, when you sell somebody, you, you got to make sure that they're happy with the purchase. Yeah. If they like you, they'll buy from you. If you keep contact with them, text them on their birthday. You don't even have to call them. Text is a fantastic tool. Which yeah. We didn't even have cell phones back then. Yeah. But you text them on their birthday, send them a text. Happy birthday. Call me if you need anything. You do that every single year. Keep up with your people. Treat them nice. Deliver them uh, better than they can get anywhere else when they come by their car. Uh, and they'll always buy from you. They'll always give you a shot. Yeah, give so you the opportunity. Just keep up with your folks and yeah. be nice and be sincere and just tell them straight up and do I everything was, right. I was the younger sibling, and so I had to lick. And so my sister, I have a half-sister, obviously, you know that, but the listeners may not. And so when you would make us do the Christmas cards every Christmas, it was like I was the one that had to lick and stick the stamp, and then she got to stuff, stuff the envelope. And so that's what happens to kids when you're the youngest. You yeah. have to lick envelope. And like now, like no one would ever do that now because they're peel and stick now. Yeah. And you have text messaging. Correct. So I wish we had text messaging then. There's where, there's where that's at. All right. Tell us something you think that's true that nobody else agrees with you on. That nobody agrees yeah, with me on? Yeah, or like most on? people wouldn't agree with you on. What's something you think is true that most people wouldn't agree with you on? Uh, I think in the business world, I'd, I'd say my, my motto is hire, train, and retain, and then leave them alone. I don't get involved in my employee's business whatsoever. Once I hire them, make sure they know what they're supposed to do, I leave them alone. I stay out of their way. I don't get involved in their business. I don't walk in and say, what's going on right there? I let them make the decisions, and, and they're going to make wrong decisions, and they're going to make right decisions. So long as they learn from the wrong decisions, um, then that will help them become good at their job. Yeah. But if you're just standing over them and... Uh, micromanaging them, then you, you don't really need them. You need to do the job yourself because obviously you don't know how to teach them how to do it. Yeah. Hire, train, retain, leave them alone. And most businesses don't do that. Yeah. They hire you and they, they want to micromanage you and tell you how to do everything. Why do they need you? Do it yourself. Then. Yeah. So that's where most businesses are different than my philosophy. Yeah. I like that. So I think that's mine too. I think, I don't, I don't know if I picked that up from you or not. I know I, I know I, I think I've told up, you that a million times. Yeah, I know I picked up the, like, train them and leave them alone part, for sure. Because I, I feel like people have brains, and they want to use them. Yep. They want to have the autonomy to make those decisions and stuff. That's how they get good. Yeah. All right, so tell us about you growing up. You didn't have, like, a super normal childhood, right? I grew up in the 60s, and I was like a whole lot of people. It was a, it was a rough living. We lived in the country. I had a mean stepdad. Um, we, we, had, uh, we rodeoed. We had uh, cows. Oh, and didn't you pigs. do like the head and heel thing? I did or? the head and Ricky did the healing. Then what is that like a lasso? Yeah, yeah, a cowboy. Yeah, team, ro team roping. Team roping. There it is. Yeah, yeah. 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 We did that till we were till from baby long. When we were old enough to get on a horse, we started doing that, and then we did it till I was fourteen and Ricky was fifteen, and then my mom, my mom left him. Yeah. And got away from that bad situation. Yeah. Like overnight though. Oh yeah. Yeah, like yeah. you guys like packed up to go to packed a up, family in, reunion or class reunion up, or something. Got, yeah, we lived in Oklahoma. We packed up, got in a car, uh, a Impala station wagon with wood on the side of it, like, like uh, yeah, Chevy Vacation, yes, whatever that is. Yeah, uh, Chevy Chase uh, yep, Vacation. Yeah, vacation. yeah, yeah, yeah. Jumped on the road, and my sister turned around, looked at me and my brother, and said, "We're uh, we're never going back." And we were shocked because you know we were always scared if we ever left, it, it would be a big problem. A brawl. Oh yeah. So yeah. anyway, we just slipped away, and he didn't know we were leaving. Where did y'all so go? Went to Oklahoma to my grandparents' house. Oh my gosh. And he never came there? Uh -uh. No, he never came there. Not my mom and brother and her, her sister and my older cousin, they all went back and got her stuff a few weeks or months later. I don't know how long. Yeah. We got what we could get from him. Yeah. And, uh, and got out of there. It was, that, that was a violent situation. Oh my but gosh. But they got there and got some, our clothes and what we could get and like how great, away. I mean, Grandma, anybody that knew <clears throat> your mom, Grandma Jeannie, she was a one of a kind woman. Mm -hmm. But imagine like what the courage it took to do that, to leave that situation. Yeah. And for women and men that may be in situations like that, that's hard. Yeah. It's hard. Domestic abuse is, is not something that I think can be judged from the outside. Well, the 60s, 60s and 70s were a different time. And if there was no go getting a man for beating his kids or beating his wife, there was no such thing. They didn't go arrest you and put you in jail. Yeah. The man was the head of the household. And on top of that, he was everything in the family. They yeah, just, because they he didn't was question, working. They he was didn't doing, question yeah. the, the man. 
Yeah. So there was there was a a, a lot of a lot of that physical abuse that uh, in my whole generation that that went unchecked. So anyway. Yeah. Makes you tough if you can get through it. Yeah, if you can get through it. I mean, yeah. leave some trauma for sure. But yeah, yeah, for real. It teaches you how not to raise your family. That's. I mean, I think that I think that you know, um, I think that how you're raised it either teaches you how to be or how not to be. Well, it's a choice. It is. Yeah, yeah you have you, to make that choice. You have to choose what kind of human being. You're do you being. become the same as you know the person that maybe wasn't a good influence, or do you become the same as the person that was? Right. Yeah. So you've always been passionate about giving back, though. You used to be on the board of the Boys and Girls Club mm -hmm. and those kind of things. Do you think that's fueled from your years of um, living in such a tough situation when you were a kid? Uh, maybe. It, it, it's some of that, and it's some of I just like to help everybody have a better life. Yeah. Um, because that's, that's the way, and not just to help you to be successful, because that didn't benefit me whatsoever. Right, yeah. Uh, other, other than just self-gratification <clears throat> for helping other people. Um, a lot of the kids in the boys and girls club don't have anything and their parents are struggling and and they don't have the finances to give them beds uh food and things like that and we did a lot of that we did a lot of good in the boys and girls club in Bryant. yeah a lot but anyway just to try to help other people have a better life yeah well, what do you do for fun golf fish golf golf, wood, golf fish woodwork woodwork how did you get into yeah. woodworking i uh, moved up here and and my wife wouldn't come for a year she didn't want to move up here, and, yeah. we, had, and we and we had a house in 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 Bryant, yeah, that, or Benton, like on, on Hurricane Lake that we hadn't sold, so we had to transition and find a house up here. So I I was up here by myself, and she saw something in a house we were looking at, and she said, "Well, oh, I'd like to have that." And I said, "Well, I'll make it." And she said, "Yeah, right." Well, you'd never built a thing when I was growing never up. Never built a thing. Yeah. So then the challenge was on. Yeah. So I started making things. Yeah. So, and. You know, what, six years later, I make beds and cutting boards and dressers and desks and, and canes. And, and plyo boxes for my cheerleading program. Plyo boxes and any, anything wood I like yeah. to make. Yeah. 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 Ah, all right. So um, is there anything else you want me to ask you about? No, not really. What's next for you? Uh, work a few more years and uh, continue to grow our, our uh, Landers Toad NWA and help other people become successful and, and then... Uh, play golf, do a little fishing, go yeah. to the lake, make a few more cutting boards. There you go. Just kind of, kind of live life. You do know? your thing. Do my okay. Thing, so I life. know my listeners are going to want to know this question. What was it like to raise me? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so. I feel like you just took a deep breath. You're like, yeah. Oh, here we go. <laughs> so you were, you were as a baby, you were headstrong from day one. You never stopped talking. That's, I guess that's why you like to do this. Uh, <laughs> Now people just have to listen. Day one, never stop talking, never stop moving, um, always into something, and it and it, it didn't it didn't stop from from grade school to junior high to to all the cheerleading and the softball and everything that you 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 did in school to to now. It was it it wasn't you were uh, for the most part you were a good kid. You know, you had your times, yeah. your challenges. Snuck out here and there. Snuck did a out few here things. and there. Did a few things that uh, I'm sure most kids did. Uh, but all in all, you're a great kid. But uh, and, but you were very headstrong. Headstrong. Yep. Yeah. That's why you're successful doing what you do today. Well, thanks, Dad. Because you get a plan and you and you put it in place and you stick to it. You stick what, to the plan. What's the best thing that you taught me growing up? You think? Uh, be honest. Be honest. Uh, help other people. Be a good human being. Yeah. Yep. That made me teary eyed. That's so true. <laughs> That's so true. That's yep. good. That's good. All right. So I have a question that I ask every one of my guests um, at the end is what is one thing you've always wanted to do, but you haven't yet? Probably go to Alaska. Talked about going oh, to Alaska. Oh, yeah. I just went. Fly up. Yes. You now, know, I didn't fly do... up and then go take a cruise through there, you yes. know, and maybe stay a couple of days here and there. So I don't know if it cruise would be the right thing, but maybe go to Alaska. And that's not a giant thing on my bucket list, but, uh, I mean, I've got to go all, go all over the country and play in really nice golf courses. And, you know, Connie and I've got to travel a little bit here and there to Scotland and Italy and Monaco and Hawaii, but I like to go somewhere for maybe an extended trip, you know, two, yeah. three weeks somewhere yeah. cause I've worked all my life. So yeah, yeah. Two, three week trip somewhere. That'd be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe go to Costa Rica. We could probably do that and stay for eight or 10 days. Yeah. Longer than Four days, five days, and travel for two or three days. Yeah, that's the hard part because if you travel somewhere, you know, then you got yeah. you're not really 
hang like experiencing it on travel days. Right. Well, we did the Disney cruise, you know, through um, out of Canada, up through mm-hmm. Alaska with crew. And then we have some friends in Vancouver in Canada that we met and uh, had lunch with while we were up there. And they told us about this um, small cruise line called Un... Oh, hold on. Uncruise. That's what it's called. So, like, a big cruise ship is going to have, like, what, thousands and thousands yeah, and thousands. Yeah, I don't want to do yeah. that. So, this, these ships have, like, 70, 80 people on them. Mm-hmm. And when you get up in the morning, there's, like, the menu for the day. And you let them know what it is that you want. It's, like, fresh caught stuff and mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff. And then, like, here's a couple activities to choose from today. And they pull up, like, on the coast. But it's not, like, a port. And the activities may be, like, hiking, paddleboarding, and what, you know, and are just chilling on the beach. Right. And so it's a, and so Justin and I are interested. Um, Nat Geo does something like that, too. It's a little, like, pricier. But we're interested in doing more of, like, a, like an adult-only type thing that's in Alaska. That's what we'd be interested in, Because yeah. that's what we said. When we went to Alaska, we loved Alaska so much that we wanted to go back and explore Alaska. More. Right. Because we really only spent, like, three half days in Alaska, even though we did the Alaskan cruise. So, yeah, yeah it was really cool. Well, thanks for being a guest. Okay. I feel like I'll listen to this episode for years to come. I told you, like, your great <laughs> we'll grandkids, will, oh, they'll be listening to their papa one day. Yep. Yeah. I hope so. All right. Until next time, guys. You've been listening to the Grit Crusade podcast with Brooke Clack. Our theme song is Thunder City by Lunar Ray, licensed through Soundstripe. This podcast was produced by Luminate Media Group. Thank you for listening, and we will see you on the next episode.